Welcome to the Preparing for the Java 21 Cert and Learning New Features talk. I know it's the last talk of the day, but you can't leave because you want to win the raffle. So this is great. I have a captive audience who wants to learn things for another hour so they're not sitting around waiting and twiddling their thumbs. I am the author of the Java 8, 11, 17, and this year 21 certification books. At the end of this, in addition to the real raffle, I will be giving away this physical book to one of you, which is about Java 17. We'll do that by random draw to, for everyone who sits through this presentation. We got a little bit of a disclaimer here. I do not work for Oracle, so I don't have to read you the Oracle Safe Harbor statement. Yay. Um, I do have my own disclaimer, which is I'm not authorized to tell you any non-public information that Oracle has told me, or even if they have told me any. Um, so take that for what it's worth. But I know a lot about certification as evidenced by said books. And the final disclaimer is for my publisher. Anything in this presentation may appear in the book later. I own it. It's OK. All right. So what happens if you want to take a cert? Well, you might have noticed that there is no Java 21 certification out yet. But rest assured, it is coming. Um, and there's two ways of taking a cert when it's brand new. One of them is to learn everything yourself. That strategy is a nuisance because there's a lot of information and you have to discern what's important and figure out how to study. The other is to read a Java 17 study guide and just learn about the diffs, which conveniently are in this presentation. Um, and the third one is to just take the 17 and not worry about it. I'm assuming everyone here is either interested in learning Java 21 or taking the cert. It doesn't have to be both, and therefore you're in the right room. So what are we going to be doing over the next 40, 40 to 45 minutes or so? Well, we're going to be covering these topics. And I included the likelihood of them being on the exam, given the whole the objectives aren't out yet and they're subject to change and not being public and all that stuff. So virtual threads are pretty much guaranteed to be on the exam. They're one of the really exciting new features in Java 21. So I put them first. Pattern matching for switch and record patterns are also super likely to be on the exam. They're new syntax. The exam is really big on syntax and making sure we know it. Sequence collections, I think, have a pretty low chance of being on the exam. While they're interesting, they're not that useful. And more importantly, they're an interface. There's not that much to ask you about it. So I'm covering it in the presentation because I think it's a non-zero chance and good to know about, but probably not the most important thing. And then there's a few other topics that I don't think are going to be on the exam at all, but I still want you to know about because the learning Java 21 part is still important. With that, let's get started. Um, this is the first talk where I have used Dolly to help me generate images. So there's some not very relevant images throughout the presentation because I wanted an excuse to play with it and I needed motivation. So we've got our virtual thread. See, they're imaginary. All right, so leaps in concurrency. We started out a long time ago with threads. Every time you wanted to do something, you created a new thread. And you remembered whether you had a call start or run, because if you did it right, you didn't have any concurrency going on. And that got to be a pain. So we got the executors in Java 4 or 5 where you could say, OK, I want to pull these threads. I don't want to manage each one all by myself. It's a pain in the neck. right? Java, please do it for me. And we've used those for a while, and they're really good. They, they abstract the level of concurrency that you don't have to deal with it. Just say, you know, I want there to be seven threads in the pool, or I, want, I don't even want to know. You manage it and tell me, and you know, tell me when we're done. And that worked out really well. But it had a problem, which we'll see shortly. And virtual threads solved that problem, which came in Java 21. Oh, and there's also a bunch of APIs. So why do we need threads at all? Well, suppose we want to do something. Our program says, hey, do we, wa we want to do a calculation and call a REST API. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. And then we want to do another one. So in order to do that, we have to wait on the first REST API to come back. That takes a while and involves the network, which in computer time might as well be forever. And then we do the other calculation and call the other REST API, and we wait for forever again. And then we get our answer. So that was what threads were designed to solve. You could have both of these happen at the same time, and we're still waiting for this long time in computer time, but we were doing it at the same time, so you weren't doubling your wait. And if you had a lot of REST APIs you were calling, of course, this would be even worse. There's only two here because this is a slide and I didn't have room to put a lot of threads, but you get the idea. The more you have, the more time you save. But threads are super heavy. So what wound up happening was you'd start your thread, and the CPU is like, I did my calculation. I'm bored. When's the REST API going to be back? And the network is like, I'm busy. I'm waiting for a reply. I'll get back to you later. So OK, it's better than with one thread, but it's still it, it's slow. So with virtual threads, what we do is we still have one platform thread, 
but it's doing the work. So we're going to do the virtual thread example. Now we have, OK, our virtual threads are saying, hey, I want to do stuff. So our platform threads were bored. But our virtual threads were not, because we only had one underlying thread. So the first thre virtual thread does its calculation, says, OK, I'm waiting for the network. You know what? I'm going to wait over there. Tell me when, I'm, tell me when you're done. Get back to me. I, I don't need any resources till then. And the real thread says, oh, cool, because I have this other virtual thread that wants to do work. Does it, it's a little calculation, sends off the rest call. Same deal, go, go wait with the other guy over there. I'll tell you both when we're done. And it keeps doing that with as many virtual threads as we have. If it runs out before the REST API comes back, that's not a problem. It's the thread, the one thread. Like, I'm going to wait, and I'm going to let everybody know. Gets its REST call back. Hey, virtual thread one, it's your turn again. Right, so you don't have these heavy resources that are sitting around waiting for things to happen. You really don't want your CPU to be bored when you have operations for it to do. When, it's, when you're waiting and your program has nothing to do, by all means, other things on the computer can run. But with the heavyweight threads, they're occupying a lot of resources while they're bored. That's not so good. So when is it most helpful? It's helpful when you have lots and lots and lots of threads. Thousands of threads are ideal. Hundreds of threads are great. Two threads, not so good. Also, it's important that you not be CPU bound. If all of your threads are doing CPU intensive processes, your CPU is very much not bored. And then virtual threads will help you, but not help you anywhere near as much because you don't have this extra capacity that you're sitting around wasting. Does that make sense? Question? Oh, OK, cool. Um, questions are going to be interesting, especially for people in the back, because I can only see like eight rows, and then everybody is dark and invisible. Um, so if you do have a question that I don't see you, either move to the front or just yell it out loud, and I'll hear you. All right, so comparing these two threads. Platform threads are what we've called threads from the very beginning. So if you say thread, platform thread. Virtual threads are new, and they're super late, lightweight. Threads are tied to OS resources. Virtual threads are not. They do have to run on an operating system or platform thread, of course, because that's where the resources live. But there's not a mapping. Not only is there not a one-to-one -one mapping, there's not even a one-to-end mapping. When a virtual thread wants to run, it says, I need a real thread. Anybody platform thread? And the platform says, oh, oh I'm free. I'll, I'll, I'll run your work right now. So it can run on a mixture of threads throughout its life cycle, and it's totally fine. That's what makes it so lightweight and makes it virtual. Real threads are often pooled because we got through saying that real threads are super expensive, so you don't want to keep creating them. Virtual threads are not. They're short-lived. When they're done, they die, they get garbage collected, and they go away. Because they're so cheap, there's no reason to have that overhead of pooling them. It's less expensive to just start over. And finally, they are um, threads, but they're different types of threads. So to create your virtual thread, you can use a number, oh, to create a regular platform thread, rather, you can create a, call a number of executor methods. You can get one, you can get a fixed number, you can cache them. But you can also now get a virtual thread per task executor. And the per task is what I was talking about before with it goes away when we're done. Right? There's nothing else to say. This is all good. Another change that has nothing to do with virtual threads but came up in Java 21 is that executor service is now auto-closable. Woohoo! Anybody who's used it before knows that this is super exciting, that you don't have to remember to call shutdown anymore. Um, yeah, I see the fists in the air for someone who's in the beginning of the audience there. Um, and that, that's really good, because if you forget to call shutdown, bad things happen. It's way easier to let Java deal with it for you. You don't have to. You can still do it the traditional way and call shutdown yourself or shut down now. If you want to kill the tasks that are running, you have to do that explicitly. But most of the time, we weren't doing that. Most of the time, we were calling shutdown or not and had a hanging program. But we want to be able to do this gracefully, and it's nice that it happens automatically. If you don't want to use executor service, maybe you want one virtual thread. I don't know why, but maybe. Um, you can call thread.platform or thread.virtual to get a single thread of your choosing. The thread constructor returns a platform thread because this is Java, and we believe in backward compatibility. There is no constructor to get a virtual thread. There's only the factory method. Um, that's good. I, I wouldn't want it to be confusing of, wait, if I pass in true, what, wait, what, what does that mean again? I'm not going to mess up thread.virtual. 
So what about scope values? You might have seen some presentations on virtual threads, and there's a whole thing about scope values, and it was long and complicated. You had data, and it only worked within a certain scope. It is a preview feature. Yay, that means it's not on the exam. And the reason I'm excited, it'll, it'll be on the next exam, don't worry. But the reason I'm excited about it not being on the 21 exam is because that's going to give people a year or two of experience with it before it's on the exam. And people will know what best practices are and test us on those versus someone's guess on it. Plus, there'll be more conferences and more exposure. When I've, I've seen two scope values presentations thus far, it reminds me a lot of streams when I was learning it, that the first couple presentations are like, that sounds nuts. I'm never going to understand this. And then it's like, oh, I, I think I'm getting it now. It's like, yeah, this makes sense. I, I get it. I can teach it to other people. And I see this coming with scope values, so I'm excited that it's delayed a little to give people that opportunity. Each of our section ends with a couple of practice questions. I am going to attempt to do this with raised hands and see how it goes, but we might have to switch formats. I've never given this in the dark before. Woohoo, innovation. All right, so there's a couple of proposals of how you can work with or create a virtual thread. I'm going to put my glasses on to try to make this better. I don't know if it will. Um, who thinks A is a valid way of doing this? Raise your hand. No hands, good. Who thinks B? Okay, who thinks C? All right, I can see hands even in the back. I'm very excited about this. I can't see your faces, but I saw the movement of your hands go up, so we're going to keep going with the hands. C is, in fact, one of the correct answers. What about D? Who thinks it's D? No hands, that's good, you're all listening. Who thinks it's E? Yep, E is right. And who thinks it's F? Like, of course not, it's E. OK, so now we have um, which of these can be used to work with a virtual thread. So this is our, this is the same question. This isn't supposed to be here, so we're going to skip it. Uh, and I'll write it down later. OK, so we'll forget question two existed and go on to question three. Um, I was trying to fix question two from my other presentation, and I clearly fixed it by copying question one over it. Um, what is true of do stuff at line V1? So we're thinking about what's happening with do stuff, and I'm going to give you 15 seconds to think about it so I can write down that question two is wrong. All right. You've all had time to think about it. Who thinks it's A? Okay, we've got a good number of A's. Who thinks it's B? Nobody. Who thinks it's C? Got one brave person in the front, and who thinks it's D? Okay, and the answer is C. Good job to the brave person in the front. Um, when you call auto closable, it uses shutdown, not shutdown now. So it sits around and waits at the end of the try with resources for all of your threads, or in this case, virtual threads to complete, at which point it continues execution. So by definition, when you get to line V1, everything has in fact completed. If I were to have called shutdown now on um, it, we would have just ended it and it would have been B. There is no scenario for it to be B A with try with resources. If there, this code were from Java, let's say 9, 11, whatever, I, I couldn't have used the try with resources because it wasn't auto closable. But if I had code that looked like this without the try with resources, it would have been A. That's why we they added it to try with resources so you wouldn't have this problem of Wait, is the code running? So this is important for the cert or not, that this is a pretty big behavior change of like we don't have to have the word shut down on the screen anymore to have it behave in a logical manner. Well, are there any questions on virtual threads before we go on to the next topic? Okay, do not see any questions. I think we're good to go on. Our next question is pattern matching for switch. Remember, I was playing with Dolly. It was fun. Uh, pattern matching is a feature that's evolved a lot, both through preview and final. It started with switch expressions. Then we had pattern matching with instance of. Then we had pattern matching for switch and record patterns, also in this presentation. And in preview in 21, therefore not on the exam, is unnamed variables and patterns. Um, it is going to be final in Java 22, so next time there's an exam, it'll be on it, but not right now, and therefore not in this presentation. But it's been really cool to see this, because as Java evolved, we got to see the benefit of the incremental delivery of every six months. There were some changes. That's why pattern matching for Switch had four preview releases. 
wasn't quite right the first time, but it was able to be changed instead of something that we had to live with forever. All right, so we have some code here. Can anyone say what this prints? You can just shout it out. How many lines? Three, yeah, exactly, because there's no break, and we all know bad things happen if there's no break, so it matches on Vegas, and it outputs table games, lotto. Maybe. Happy 21, if you're in the U.S., you can gamble now. Java's old enough to gamble. <laughs> um, or Java versions are old enough to gamble. All right, so we've, we've switched this. Um, we now have the same example again. Uh, I don't think I advanced, sorry. Um, then we have switch expressions, the next example, where we still don't have a break, but it behaves better. Switch expressions are using the arrow, and with switch expressions, you don't need the break because it only executes one of them. So we get the table games that we were hoping for and nothing else. We can see that the arrow has dealt with that for us, and that's all very good. You can also have multiple values in the traditional switch or express, switch expression now, which makes it a little easier to read instead of doing the whole multiple cases and where does the break go and you know who knows what. Okay. You can also, with a switch expression, store the result in a variable, um, which is pretty cool. It makes for more concise um, coding. You're able to say, okay, well, it's going to be one of these three strings. I'm going to put it in a variable. It does have to be deterministic, which is why there's a default here. I can't put undefined in a variable. So if I'm storing the result of my switch expression in a variable, I have to ensure all the cases are covered. And there's a semicolon at the end of it because it is a statement. Um, I'm putting in the variable, it needs to be a thing. Okay, so everything I've just said before is not new to Java 21. Now we're getting in the new stuff. The first new thing is pattern matching with switch. Pattern matching allows me to say more than I had before. In particular, you can see the when. So case integer i when i is greater than or equal 21 means you can in fact gamble. That's the new part, the when i is greater than or equal 21. Before Java 21, we were able to do um, a, a little bit of matching, not so much. Now we can do types, which is the case integer i, or types with guard conditions, which is the when i is greater than or equal to 20. And you can see in this example that it is in fact deterministic. We've handled null. We're not required to handle null. If we don't handle null and we try to dereference um, object, it will give us a null pointer, which is not what we want, but it is backward compatible. So it's better to get in the habit of handling null so that you control the behavior, because I don't want my code to blow up if object is null. Then I check if it's an integer that is bigger than 21. Cool, you can gamble. If not, it's, if it's still an integer, I know that it's an integer under 21. You can't gamble. Then for random reasons, we have that, may well, maybe object is a string, because why not? So we've got two ones there um, of maybe it's poker, maybe it craps. I could have combined those with an or, but I didn't, because I felt that would be harder to read. And then I have, or is it a different string? Okay, cool, other game. And then I have my default of, all right, we've gone through everything that I was expecting to happen here, and you've called this wrong. So it's going to throw a new illegal argument that this was not what was supposed to happen. So we now have our guard clause, and we have our pa pattern variable, the i. Um, the pattern variable is the same pattern variable that you had with the pattern matching with if statements, where we said instance of i, and then we were able to refer to i as if it were a real variable. Um, this presentation will be online at Speaker Deck sometime tonight. Might be late. Um, I can't put it online earlier because then you'll all have the answers, and then we'll be flipping through and not learning anything. I made that mistake once. Okay, so we, we talked about the null pointer is specified, so we don't have a, we have the null is specified, so we don't have a null pointer. The order of these things does matter. Um, so I can't do this. I can't have case integer i before the i with the guard condition because I will never get there. We have that with catch and exceptions, so this shouldn't be something that's unique to anybody, right? With catch, you can't say I want to catch exception and later be like I want to catch runtime exception. It's like too late, you did it already. And it's the same thing here. If I've matched integer i, I can't match integer i when i is greater than or equal 21 because I've already matched integer i. So by definition, it can't get that far. And the compiler is very happy to tell me about that fact. That it's like, you can't do that, right? So you made a typo, you ordered it wrong, you didn't realize what you were doing. Um, one of them, you have to fix it because it doesn't make any sense. So those are some built-in types. Was there a question? No, okay. Our next example has an enum. It's a deck of cards because we're, we're going with the Vegas and gambling theme. 
And we also got our symbols. Um, got some Unicode symbols in my code. You almost never get to use those, so that was fun. And I'm, I'm doing a switch expression where I'm saying that it's going to be one of these four suits. And based on the suit, I'm going to return the appropriate Unicode character. Um, you'll notice that I used a mix of the enum and the enum dot whatever, um, deck dot diamond versus heart. Both of those were legal. I obviously don't recommend that you use both in the same switch expression. I did it here to reinforce that you could. Question? Minor, I don't know, deck should be suit or suit should be deck. Yeah, deck should be suit. Hey, look at that. <laughs> This is not my first time giving the presentation before, which means that I have managed to sneak that error by like 30 people. Good catch. Thank you. This, I, I'm new to this. The idea of you as body parts and you put a part as a body part, it would also have a problem with this, right? Not sure what a body part is. Like a heart, lung, yeah, and new body parts, heart, lung. Oh, like a large number of, yeah, yes. Yeah, so you had a heart in two different... Oh, if I had that, it would have a compiler error because heart would be ambiguous. Gotcha. I was still thinking of cards, like there's no body parts in hearts, in, in cards. But yeah, yes, it, you have to, just, that's um, been around since forever. Like with date, we would have that, that you're trying to import date from Java SQL and Java Util, and it's like, I don't know what you want, fix it. Um, that would absolutely happen, and that would be an advantage of using deck.hard or bodypart.hard. Good question. Um, so if I miss any of these, it won't compile because we'll be back to the problem. I have an undefined case. Java doesn't know what to do with that. Okay. Um, next up, we have an example with a Boolean, and uh, sorry, an integer and returning a Boolean. So we get our integer of age. Um, we care about whether the age is less than 40, um, and if so, we set check to true, otherwise we set it to false, and I've got the breaks because I'm using the traditional switch. Don't write this, use a switch expression. Um, this again is here so that you know it's legal and that you can do it this way, but you know, please don't. Okay, next up we have pattern variable scope. This is fun, just like it is for if statements. Um, if I were to write this with a traditional switch, it won't compile because I will still be in scope or potentially in scope and it will have trouble with this. And I say potentially because potentially is very important. Um, but you can't use the variable because it could fall through even though I've told it not to fall through. Um, Java at some point gets confused and is like, you know, I'm just going to not allow that. So try not to reuse things with traditional switches. But as I said before, use a switch expression and you don't have this problem. All right, so what can't you do? In your switch expression or your traditional switch, X can't be a Boolean, a float, a double, or a long. Um, that's never been allowed and it hasn't changed, but I want to call attention to it because now we can replace some of our if statements with switches. So all of a sudden we care about stuff that has always been illegal because it's like, wait, why can't I get rid of my long? Well, it's not allowed. You also can't use an underscore as a pattern right now, but you can in Java 22. So I'm just throwing that out there. If you read about it, maybe you're reading Java 22 docs and you're on Java 21 because it's an LTS, you're gonna have to wait to start using underscore. Underscore just means I don't have a variable name because I'm not going to use it and I wanna make that fact clear. Okay, so now we have some questions. This one I'm gonna let you read for a minute because there's a lot of code on it. We're trying to figure out how many of these lines we need to remove in order to make this code compile. All right, who thinks it's A? Who thinks this compiles as is? Yeah, nobody thinks that. We're going to do the raising your hands thing, though. Who thinks it's B? Raise your hand if you think it's B. All right, we got some Bs. Good amount. Who thinks it's C? Okay, we've got a few people. And who thinks it's D? A few people. So we're all over the place. Um, it is C. You have to get rid of the line with string S on it, um, the one where it throws an illegal argument exception, or um, actually not order because then it would be two. Um, because getting rid of that line causes the two lines below it to compile. You could get rid of the two lines below it, but we're going for the minimum number of lines. You also have to get rid of either case object O or default because the, both of those are catch-alls. Um, so you, it doesn't matter which one you get rid of, but they can't both be here because Java is left with the unreachable code problem of, well, you matched on object O, there's nothing else. You know, what do you mean by this default thing or vice versa? So that one's kind of fun because it's tricky, just like search. 
Yeah. If it's null, will it not get default or null pointer instead in this case? Um, it won't throw a null pointer because I don't do s dot anywhere. I made sure to do blackjack equals s. Which, uh, like, will that throw a null pointer because we don't have the null cases? No. Oh. I mean, it will if I pass a null. But yeah, but it's always done that. But like, it won't call. It won't break in my code. It'll break flat out at the beginning. It won't hit default. It won't even hit default. It, it'll be like null's not allowed. You get a null pointer, and it's done that since the dawn of time. Which is why you want to put your own null in it so it's clear what happens because you may or may not want that behavior. But it compiles. <laughs> All right. Um, so now we have, speaking of null, um, we're going to call this method twice, once with slots and once with null. And we want to see if we can figure out what happens for both cases. So two of these answers will be correct. Who thinks A is one of the answers? We got a bunch of hands, you all are correct. Who thinks B is one of the answers? Bunch of hands, good. And I'm not gonna ask for C and D because A and B were the answers. Um, A is an answer because slots is not one of the two strings of special meaning, so it uses the throw null, new illegal argument exception, and B is an answer for the reasons that we just discussed. Okay, another question here. Um, we're making the same call, but this time the code is different. Who thinks A is an answer? Yep, A is still an answer. Who thinks B? Nobody, good. Who thinks C? Yeah, a bunch of people. It is C now. So since we've explicitly stated what happens with null, Java knows. On to record patterns. We're making good time. Records, they're things that you used to play, used to play music if you're old. Um, we had one at home when I was growing up. I was afraid to use it because every time I used it, it scratched and I got in trouble. Uh, so we've got our record patterns. This time we have two enums and a record. The enums are what they sound like, the suit and the rank. Um, a rank is the number on your card, so like one through nine or ace or king or whatever. And then we have a card which consists of a suit and a rank. I made that small because I assume everyone is familiar with the deck of cards and doesn't need to study the numbers. Then we have an if statement from when we had instance of with if and it checks to see whether it's a card. If so, we get our C, we dereference it, we're able to use it, um, and we are able to, so we were able to do that before. But what's new is the second if statement, where we're able to expand it, and it does the dereferencing for us, so we can refer to them as those variables. So I can now say suit instead of c.suit, and rank instead of c.rank. This is nice, it makes the code easier to read, and I don't have so much going on inside my if statement. I'm expressing the intent of what I'm expecting to happen. So I've deconstructed my card into suit and rank, and now I have those variables available to me instead of card. Question. What about pins? What about what? Pins, pin slot cards. Yeah, yeah there's no number. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. You, you have num one and a Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Wow. Nobody caught that one either. See what happens when you have a bigger audience? You find all your problems. Um, in case anyone's wondering, this is the second time I've given this presentation publicly. Is there another error? No, no, no. Another error. Mine's a question. What if there's a suit rank and, I don't know, some other property? Can you only extract the ones that you want? Um, no, you have to extract all of them. You can choose not to use them, of course. Um, but you do have the unused variable there. With Java 21, you can do the underscore thing, I think, but don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, but no, right now you have to say what all of them are. So if you have a record that has 20 parameters, you probably don't want to do this. Also, your record shouldn't have 20 parameters. Okay, you can also nest record patterns, which is pretty cool. So when you go to Vegas, they don't use one deck of cards because people count cards, so they, they put a whole pile of decks on the table. And then you've got multiples of the same. So we created a multi-deck with the deck number and the card. And you can see that I can dereference both of them at the same time. So I did reference my multi deck, deconstruct my multi-deck into the deck number and the card. And then I deconstruct my card into the suit and the rank. And then I can use all three of those as if they're legit variables. So that's pretty cool. 
Um, do watch your line breaking and indentation if you've got a um, nested record so that you remember where things came from, because um, that's fun. So now we have our switch pattern matching with records. Um, this should look pretty similar to the if statement that we saw on the previous screen. So I've deconstructed my card into a suit and a rank, and now I'm saying I only care about hearts. Um, but I did all of that inside of my switch. Um, and if it's not, I have a generic card because I want this thing to compile and I print out other and all as well with the world. This isn't so useful here because I only have one thing I'm looking for, but you can imagine in a real life scenario, I'd probably have a half a dozen scenarios and then the switch is gonna be a lot more compact than it would be if I had if statements for all of those. But I didn't list half a dozen scenarios on the screen because then none of you would be able to read them, even in the dark. Okay, next up we have another switch. We have our heart and um, we've got our problem of at the bottom of you gotta make sure that you're exhaustive because if you're using when, you need to make sure you handle all of the scenarios. So what can't you do? You still can't use underscore for unnamed patterns. Hopefully in 22, I didn't remember to check. And you can expand things that aren't records. That's something that will hopefully come in the future and something that I'm excited about. Because you know, the, all those old code examples we have with like the point class, right? I'd really like to say point X and point Y, but I can't do that yet, hopefully in the future. Okay, so we've got some more questions, lest anyone was falling asleep. Which of these compile? Raise your hand if you think A compiles. Yeah, we see some hands. A is fine, I'm not trying to trick you yet. Come in, don't worry. Who thinks B compiles? The guy with a sensitive hand up is right. Yes, B, B does in fact compile, you can use var. Um, these are considered local variables. They're scoped within a function, just like lambdas are scoped within a method. Um, I've been doing some Python lately. The word function slips in when I do Java and method slips in when I do Python. It's maddening. So I'm always using the wrong words now. Um, but yeah, you can use var. Um, it's the same deal as before. You have to be consistent about it, just like in a Lambda, but you can use it. And it's nice because it makes the code shorter. Um, who thinks C compiles? Yeah, that compiled even before. And who thinks D compiles? Those of you with your hands up are incorrect. The D does not compile. It doesn't use the right syntax. So this is a syntax that I made up. Um, <laughs> that's not the one that Java uses. Okay, so now we have our record. Um, imagine the enums we had before with suit and um, deck and rank and stuff are all here. Um, we've got a card, it's the two of hearts. Um, we have a switch statement where we have our card. We're seeing if it's the ace of hearts. And then we have another one where we're seeing if it's a heart and we want to see what happens here. So do we think it is A? No, do we think it is B? Some Ds, do we think it's C? No, do we think it's D? Some Ds, it is D, there's no case of card. So this is not exhaustive and Java has a fit. Okay, and then I think the last record mock example before we go on to the next topic. We have our two of hearts again. This is the same example as before, except it does have the case of cards, so it's exhaustive, and the people who said B before are correct now. So you're just a little too early on being correct. Okay, then we have, oh right, I like this one. So we have six examples here of how you could deconstruct a record of type card, and we wanna see how many of them compile. I'll give you 10 seconds to skim this. A, who thinks it's A? Nobody, who thinks it's B? Who thinks it's C? Who thinks it's D? Who thinks it's E? Some E's, who thinks it's F? One F, it is D, the first three compile. Um, the second ones do not. The um, fourth and sixth one are because of referencing var, and the fifth one is because the order is wrong. You have to use the same order that the record is declared in. Um, the reason that matters is, imagine if I had a point record with x and y. If I invert them, Java won't know, because these variable names don't have to match the names of the record. They do have to match the types. It's polite to give them the same variable names as your record so that your customers understand what it is your API does, but Java doesn't care what they are. So it's important that the types be in the right order. All right, sequence collections. Again, I don't think, oh, yeah. Can you do the right ones? Uh -huh. So it's suit first and then rank, but the first 
first three words, even though the second case is Rankin and Sue? Oh, so it's backwards. Was it backwards on the other slide? Huh, hey, look at that. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to fix all of these before I put it on the internet, so it's going to be late tonight or early tomorrow now. Uh, but I do want you to have something that's more useful. Wow. All right, cool. I'm glad you're all paying attention, though. Um, all right, so we have this example here. What is this output? God only knows. It depends on your version of Java and your CPU and the stars and the moon and all of that. But even if you do manage to know what it outputs, you shouldn't rely on it. On my machine, it was Mickey, but it's undefined, and you don't want to rely on behavior that's undefined. So in Java 17, we had our collections look like this. We had list, queue, set, a map, and then a bunch of things under them. Um, then array list, link list, deck, tree set, and tree map became sequence collections, sort of, in that they got methods that had sequence in them but they didn't have the full sequence collection interfaces. In Java 21, they inserted the new interfaces into the hierarchy and pulled them up the methods into them. And that's why I think this is unlikely to be on the exam. The methods aren't new, so they're not that interesting. But we've got the methods you can call on sequence collections. You can add stuff in various orders. You can get a defined order, for you can get a reverse defined order, and you can actually rely on the order, which makes the code a lot safer to write. Um, you do want to say that you're working with the sequence set if you're relying on the order both to get access to these methods and for clarity. So now if I run this, I get Donald, and it's not going to change when I go over to Fred's computer and wonder why his tests don't work on his machine, because we know it worked on my machine. I'm a developer. Thank you for the laughs. I worked hard on that joke. Okay. So um, th this one, it's number four and five. I don't think there's value in understanding um, what, whether, you know, reading all the details here, but hash set is not sequence, so the first three are wrong, and the last one is wrong because the set is not a map. Um, you know, this should be fairly obvious to people. Finally, we have our set of things that are good to know, but not likely to be on the exam. UTF-8 is now the default character set when reading a file. If you deal with a lot of file encodings, this is something to watch out for, and I recommend making it explicit before you upgrade so you're not caught by surprise. String builder and string buffer have a repeat method now. The string class has had one for a while, which is great when you're generating data. You can do the same thing on builder. There's a new index of method that you can um, pass in a char or a string, a begin index, and an end index. Um, rare to want to do it, but if you do, pretty useful. And you can have more details on whether you're splitting a string with delimiters. Finally, finalization is deprecated for removal. Yay. Um, that does suggest the exam will stop asking about finalization, which is exciting to me. Um, but it's something that, you know, who knows when it'll go away because this is Java and we don't seem to believe in deleting things. Okay. And then the last one, I think the odds of being on the exam are zero, but as a developer, it's important to know about, so I'm sharing it with all of you. Code snippets can now be in Javadoc. There's a few different formats for it. You use the squiggly at snippet and you write your code in and it shows up formatted in the doc. That works really well if you've got small pieces of code like this one. If you have large pieces of code, you still use the squiggly at snippet, but you can point to a file. And that's a legit file, preferably one that is really in your code so it exists. And then you set a region. And then in the code, you reference that region so you're getting a snippet of your actual file. And then when you change the code in your file, it gets changed automatically in the Java doc, and you don't have out-of-date docs. And you're also able to transform the code. So here I'm saying print line is super, super, super important. I want to highlight it so that everyone can see it.